Good evening. Welcome to Astronomy Night at Bryce Canyon National Park. I'm Don, and I've been a dark ranger here at Bryce Canyon since 2009. My program is Journey to the Virgo Cluster. It is a 60 million year journey through space time using our great night skies of Bryce Canyon as a window. Our destination is the Virgo Cluster, a huge cluster of galaxies consisting of about 2,000 members. The visible universe does extend much, much further, but this is the most distant object that we observe with our telescopes at Bryce Canyon. How far is 60 million light years? Light travels at 186,000 miles per second, or 300,000 kilometers per second. This is the distance of seven and a half trips around the Earth in a single second. At that incredible speed, the light captured in this image has been traveling through space since about the time of the demise of the dinosaurs. While on our journey, we'll be viewing some great images, most of them courtesy of NASA, like the one before us. When starting a journey, it's always a good idea to have a road map, and I have prepared one for us. We will start out from an Earth's perspective, looking at how the sky moves over the course of a night and the course of a year. Our next stop will be the solar system. It now contains eight planets after the reclassification of Pluto to a dwarf planet. The reason for this is that other objects similar to Pluto have been found in the Kuiper Belt, an area of the outer solar system. In order to avoid having an endless list of planets, the new classification of dwarf planet was introduced. When Pluto was discovered in 1930, it was named for the god of the underworld. Now we move on to our home galaxy, the Milky Way, a huge mass of at least 100 billion stars. They all revolve around its center of gravity. This destination contains many great objects viewable from Bryce Canyon. Moving out further, we reach our local group, consisting of about 30 galaxies, of which our Milky Way is one of the larger members. After viewing our next door galactic neighbors, we step out to the local supercluster. It is made up of over 100 groups of galaxies, such as our own local group, with the Virgo cluster being the heavyweight, containing about 2,000 individual galaxies. This is where we're going. Now let's get on our way. The ancients believed the Earth was surrounded by a solid celestial sphere on which all stars were located. They believed this sphere rotated once a day on its axis, giving the motion of the sky. Today we know that no solid celestial sphere exists. Two stars that appear to be close together may actually be a great distance apart. We also know that the apparent motion of the sky is the result of the rotation of the Earth on its axis once a day. On the equator, we would be able to see all stars in the sky over the course of a year. But at the North Pole, we would never see any stars of the Southern Hemisphere sky. Here at Bryce Canyon, there are many interesting objects in the Southern Hemisphere that are never visible to us. Two such objects are the Magellanic Clouds, smaller satellite galaxies over Milky Way. They were named for Magellan, who saw them while sailing around the Earth in the 1500s. He had no idea what they were, but nonetheless the name stuck. Also out of review from Bryce Canyon is our closest neighboring star, Proxima Centauri. But even if we travel to the land down under, we'd never be able to see it without the aid of a telescope. It's a class of star known as a red dwarf, very plentiful in the universe, but very dim. So here at Bryce Canyon, there's much of the southern hemisphere sky we never see. Stars in the direction of the sun are still there, but the sunlight overpowers them. So on a long, clear, dark night here at Bryce Canyon, we see much less than half of the sky.
Moving out to our solar system. As the Earth travels around the Sun, our night sky is always in the other direction. The Earth is moving in its orbit at a rate of 66,000 miles per hour. As a result, any star in the sky will rise four minutes earlier than on the previous night. The accumulative effect of this will give us an entirely new night sky in six months' time. Our solar system is relatively flat, like a frisbee, so other objects in our solar system, like the Sun, Moon, and planets, appear to be within one of twelve background constellations. These are known as the constellations of the zodiac. They are actual star patterns in the sky, but astronomy does not attribute any supernatural power to them, as does astrology. Saturn is generally considered to be the most beautiful object in the solar system. It is now a highlight of our summer sky at Bryce Canyon. The sphere of Saturn is 75,000 miles in diameter, compared to only 8,000 for the Earth. Saturn is mostly a huge ball of gas, though it does have a solid core. Strong winds and powerful lightning storms are present on the planet. The rings of Saturn are about 172,000 miles across, compared to 75,000 for the body of the planet. In spite of the great width of the rings, they are amazingly thin, measuring only hundreds of yards thick. The rings are made up of billions of individual particles, some grain size, some house size, all revolving around Saturn like tiny little moons. It's now time to pull off on an asteroid and break out our road map. The next stop is our home galaxy, the Milky Way. It is a group of at least 100 billion stars revolving around its center of gravity. Our solar system is located 28,000 light years from the center. From this point, it takes about 225 million years to make one trip around the galaxy. At the core of the Milky Way is a supermassive black hole with four million times the mass of our sun. It has been discovered that most galaxies have a supermassive black hole at their center. Sometimes a star will venture too close and get sucked in and ripped apart. These are images and an illustration of such an event happening in a distant galaxy. Before we begin examining objects that we can see in our galaxy, let's first establish how far apart things really are. Our Sun is 870,000 miles in diameter, and our closest neighboring star, our little friend Proxima Centauri, is 25 trillion miles, or 4.2 light years away. So if we reduce the Sun to the size of a tennis ball, the corresponding distance to Proxima Centauri would be around 1,200 miles. At this scale, we have our tennis ball sun at Bryce Canyon and the closest neighboring star 1,200 miles away, somewhere around Kansas City. And that is the answer to this question. A lot of room out there. Now let's look at the structure of our home galaxy, the Milky Way. As mentioned, our galaxy consists of at least 100 billion stars. It is a type of galaxy known as a barred spiral, which is 100,000 light years across. In the center is a massive black hole surrounded by a bar containing countless millions of stars. From the ends of the bar extend spiral arms. Within these arms, most of the stars in the galaxy can be found. However, an individual star may not spend all of its life within a spiral arm. Some longer living stars may eventually move out of it. The best analogy of spiral arms I've heard is that they are like traffic jams of stars traveling around the galaxy. We are located in a small arm known as the Orion Spur. During the summer months, the Sagittarius arm is in our night sky. At this time of year in Bryce Canyon, we see this beautiful band of haze extending south to north across the sky, the summery Milky Way, which is the Sagittarius arm. Six months later, when the sky has changed, we are looking towards the Perseus arm, which is the winter Milky Way. 
Okay, we now have an understanding of the relative distances between objects in our galaxy and the general layout of our galaxy. Now let's begin looking at some of the celestial objects found within it. Let's first talk about the life cycle of stars. This is important to know because the objects we see in the Milky Way are products of different stages within this life cycle. All stars begin life in a stellar nebula. A huge cloud of gas and dust in space, light years wide. Some type of disturbance will cause matter in the cloud to start condensing. This will lead to the gathering of more and more gas as its gravitational attraction increases. If enough fuel is gathered, nuclear fusion will start and a star is born. Depending on the size of the new star, it will follow one of two courses through life, either that of the average star or that of the massive star. About 95% of the stars in the universe follow the path of the average star through life, ending in a quiet death. Massive stars have a violent death ending in a supernova explosion, one of the most energetic events in the universe. Let's first look at the life of the average size star, like our Sun. It began life in a stellar nebula about four and a half billion years ago. When enough fuel was gathered, it came to life as nuclear fusion began in its core. Within a few million years, it stabilized into what is known as a main sequence star, where it will remain for 90% of its life. Many main sequence stars, like our Sun, give off energy at an amazingly stable rate, allowing life on Earth as we know it to exist. In about five billion years, our Sun will start to run out of usable fuel and become unstable, swelling into a red giant. When all usable fuel is exhausted, much of its mass will collapse into a very dense object known as a white dwarf. Though the white dwarf is no longer producing new energy, it is still hot enough to illuminate a cloud of gas being cast off. These celestial objects are generally known as planetary nebula, though here at Bryce Canyon we like to call them ghost stars, since they are the wispy image of a dead star. They are a short-lived astronomical event, lasting only a few thousand years. After the cloud of gas that created the ghost star is dissipated, the white dwarf is left to cool in space, taking billions of years to cool into a black dwarf. I like to think of white dwarfs as retired stars. They are no longer producing anew, but they are still bright enough to shine on for a long time. Next, let's look at the life of a massive star. Massive stars also begin life in a stellar nebula, but gather a huge amount of hydrogen fuel in this stage. To support their great mass, they consume enormous amounts of fuel, burning blue hot. With all this fuel reserve, you would think that massive stars would have a very long lifetime. But the opposite is actually the case. A massive star like the Neb in our summer sky may live only 10 million years. An average star like our sun will live 10 billion years. A tiny red dwarf like our little friend Proxima Centauri will live for more than 100 billion years. So the red dwarfs are the Prius of stars and the massive blue giants are the Humvees of stars. When the massive stars begin to run out of usable fuel, they enter the red supergiant phase. When all usable fuel is exhausted, and no outward force remains to counter the huge weight of the star, it collapses and rebounds in a supernova explosion. This is one of the most energetic events in the universe. The remnant of a supernova explosion can be either a stellar black hole or a neutron star. We will talk more about them a little later. Now that we know about the life cycle of stars, let's look at some of the objects from different stages of this cycle that are visible in the Bryce Canyon night sky. The Lagoon Nebula is a summer object where new stars are born. It is a cloud of gas and dust in space, light years across, 
which is visible because of new stars coming to life within it. The Great Nebula of Orion is a stellar nebula in the winter sky. It even looks great through a pair of binoculars. Unlike our Sun, which is a loner, most stars in the universe are born with one or more partners with which they are gravitationally bound throughout life, orbiting about one another, kind of like in this illustration. Many stars that appear to be a single point of light to the unaided eye can be divided into two or more members with a telescope. Alberio being a great example. Open clusters are beautiful objects in the night sky here at Bryce Canyon. The double cluster of Perseus being a great example. It is made up of hundreds of young stars still near their place of birth. It is thought that our solar system was once part of an open cluster in its youth, but has since drifted away to become a loner. Another striking open cluster is the Pleiades, also known as the Seven Sisters. The last series of images were associated with the early stages in the life cycle of stars. Now let's switch to objects that are the remnants of stars that have died. First we'll examine the final years of average sized stars. When all usable fuel is exhausted, much of its mass will collapse into a very dense object known as a white dwarf. Though the white dwarf is no longer producing new energy, it is still hot enough to illuminate a cloud of gas being cast off. These celestial objects are generally known as planetary nebula, though here at Bryce Canyon we like to call them ghost stars since they are the wispy image of a dead star. They are short-lived astronomical events, lasting only a few thousand years. The Dumbbell Nebula is one of the closer ghost stars at about 700 light years away. The Ring Nebula is another popular object of this type in the summer sky. It has a tubular shape but from our viewpoint, we are looking down the barrel. Believe it or not, the Ant Nebula has a similar shape to that of the Ring Nebula, but we are viewing it from the side. The Helix Nebula is another fascinating remnant of an average star that has died is an eerie object, sometimes called the Eye of God. The Hubble telescope used to take this image is a huge time exposure camera that collects light over time. When viewing the Helix Nebula directly in our telescopes, it is a wispy image, only barely visible. The human brain controls our vision in a way that gives us 15 new images per second, which doesn't allow time to build a strong image of faint objects. This feature of our vision is not conducive to viewing distant objects directly in a telescope. However, 15 new images per second is handy for jaywalking across the busy street. Ghost stars are beautiful and bizarre objects that come in a great variety of shapes, such as a little ghost nebula. The Eskimo nebula comes with a furry hood. And my favorite, the lemon slice. The spirograph nebula. And the cat's eye nebula. The last series of images were of average size stars that have died. Now let's look at what happens when massive stars end their lives. In the year 1054 AD, a supernova was observed by several cultures around the planet. It was visible in the daytime sky for up to a month and the nighttime sky for a year. This Native American rock art in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico is thought to be an image of that event. The Chinese astronomers of the time did a very detailed recording of the supernova. Today modern instruments observe this expanding shock wave nearly a thousand years later known as the Crab Nebula.
The only nearby supernova that has occurred since modern instruments have been available to record the event was in 1987 in a nearby galaxy, 160,000 light years away. The first frame shows the star, indicated by the arrow, prior to the supernova. The second frame is the event itself. The last frame shows the expanding shock wave years later. One possible remnant from a supernova explosion is a neutron star. Much of the mass of a huge star is compressed into an incredibly dense object only a few miles in diameter. When the compression occurs, the rate of rotation greatly increases as well as the intensity of the magnetic field. The poles of the magnetic field emit high energy waves. If a pole spins by pointing in our direction, we get a pulsar. This is similar to the beam of a lighthouse passing by. The Crab Nebula produces a pulsar blinking 30 times per second. When pulsars were first discovered in the 1960s, astronomers were puzzled by them for a time. Some thought that the regular pulsation was the product of extraterrestrial intelligence. So there was talk of LGMs, little green men. But pulsars were soon found to be a natural occurring phenomena. The other possible remnant from a supernova explosion is the infamous black hole. This is an artist illustration of a black hole, 11,000 light years away. In this case, two massive blue stars formed at the same time as a binary system, revolving around their common center of gravity. One of them eventually collapsed into a stellar black hole. Black holes, by their nature, cannot be observed directly just not even light is fast enough to escape their gravitational pull. However, they can be detected by their interaction with surrounding objects. In this case, gas is being sucked from a companion star, emitting high energy waves when pulled into the black hole. A black hole created by the collapse of a star may have ten times the mass of a sun. The huge black holes found at the center of galaxies can be millions of times more massive. Any object venturing too close, well... <laughs> Globular clusters are beautiful objects found on the fringes of our Milky Way. Unlike open clusters, which consist of young stars, globular clusters are made up of old stars, which are very closely spaced, compared to our corner of the Milky Way. The great cluster of Hercules consists of at least one half million stars, which are located about 25,000 light years away. If there happened to be an inhabited planet in this area, it would be starry nights to the extreme. That wraps it up for our home galaxy, the Milky Way. Let's get out the road map and move on. Our next destination is the local group, of which our Milky Way is one of about 30 galaxies. The largest member is the Andromeda Galaxy, also known as M31. You may be familiar with the M numbers, also known as the Messier Catalog. Charles Messier was an astronomer working in the late 1700s. His passion was finding comets. He would scan the sky with his telescope, looking for fuzzy objects. When Messier found one, he would watch it for a time. If it appeared to move in relation to other objects in the sky, it was a comet and he was a happy man. But Messier often came across fuzzy objects that never moved. To avoid confusing these fuzzy spots with comets again, he cataloged them M1 through M110. Today we know they are either nebulae or clusters in our own galaxy, or in some cases, galaxies of their own right. Let's visit some of our galactic neighbors just down the block. The Magellanic Clouds are two satellite galaxies of our Milky Way, which are visible to the naked eye in the southern hemisphere. They are located 160, 170,000 light years away. In 1987, a supernova occurred in the large Magellanic Cloud. 
the nearest such event since modern instrumentation was available. The last known supernova to take place in the Milky Way was 400 years ago. The Andromeda Galaxy is the largest member in our local group. It is located about 2.4 million light years away. The Andromeda Galaxy has the distinction of being the most distant object visible to the unaided eye. And it's heading our way. In about 3 billion years, it will collide with the Milky Way. Because of the great distance between stars within galaxies, few will actually collide, but the shock wave will lead to the birth of countless new stars. Galactic mergers are common in the universe, as with the two galaxies in this image, which are 114 million light years away from us. For the last stage of our journey, let's travel to the local supercluster. Our local group is one of about 100 groups of galaxies within this structure, with the Virgo cluster being the heavyweight, containing about 2,000 individual galaxies itself. Now let's visit some of our more distant galactic neighbors. M81 and M82 are interesting galaxies for several reasons. For one, they're so close together, it's possible to get them both in the same field of view with their telescopes at the same time. Seeing multiple galaxies together is always a treat. Also, they represent two of the three types of galaxies found in the universe. M81, on the bottom, also known as the Bode's Galaxy, is a spiral galaxy very similar to the Milky Way. Its companion galaxy, M82, or the Cigar Galaxy, is an irregular galaxy. These have no particular shape. Also, the Cigar Galaxy is a starburst galaxy with a high rate of new stars coming to life. M59 is an elliptical galaxy representing the third major type of galaxy in the universe. As with a spiral in the irregular galaxies, it is a huge mass of stars revolving around their center of gravity. Unlike the other two types of galaxies, elliptical galaxies contain old stars with little new star birth. The Sombrero Galaxy is a great summer sky object. It is a spiral galaxy which is edgewise to us. There is a band of dust along the galactic plane which some people think makes it look like a sombrero. The Whirlpool Galaxy is certainly one of the most beautiful. It's a spiral galaxy which is face onto us with a nearby companion galaxy. The gravitational effect from the nearby galaxy compresses the spiral arms, giving the beautiful Whirlpool image. 60 million light years from the start of our journey, we arrive at our destination, the Virgo Cluster, the largest member of our local supercluster. It is a massive cluster containing over 2,000 galaxies covering much of the constellation Virgo. But since we've come this far, let's peek out to the edge of the universe. This is the Hubble Alter Deep Field image. It was taken in an area of the sky that would look like this to us. About 10,000 galaxies were found within it, some as far as 13 billion light years away. This image encompasses such a small area in the sky, it would require 12,700,000 of them to cover the celestial sphere around us. 10,000 galaxies were found within it. Our Milky Way contains at least 100 billion stars. This equals, I'll leave that to you. Perhaps this is a more manageable number. 7,500 visible stars with the unaided eye from Bryce Canyon on a perfect night. But this is only a calculated number. It's been a great journey, and now it's time to head home.
I like this quote by Carl Sagan, a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. When we consider the distance we have traveled, our Earth with an 8,000 mile diameter is indeed a speck. Even more finite is this thin envelope of gas clinging to the planet, our atmosphere giving us the beautiful cloud patterns. The atmosphere doesn't have an abrupt upper limit, but thins out gradually with altitude. At 10 miles high, the atmosphere is only 10% as thick when compared to that of sea level. There are two things that I find striking about our atmosphere. One, there isn't much of it. Two, it's the only known place in all of our travels where we can live. Let's move a little closer to home. This is a composite image of the night sky over North America. Bryce Canyon National Park is located in one of the last remaining large dark areas out west. Unfortunately, recent studies have shown that light pollution is encroaching on the night sky of Bryce Canyon as more development comes into the region. This light that is being blasted into the sky over the United States serves absolutely no useful purpose. Better engineered lighting that focuses light down where people actually need it can run on a fraction of the energy with the added benefit of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But we still do have a great night sky here at Bryce Canyon National Park, so go out and enjoy. And we all thank you.